All right, uh, thank you again for inviting me to talk today. So I'm going to talk about trauma of the eye and globe rupture. And some of the aspects of this talk have been covered by the previous speakers uh, in an excellent manner. So things like corneal lacerations, uh, dislocated lenses, all of those things and retinal detachment will very frequently occur in the context of a globe rupture. So I won't talk too much about that. So how do we <coughs> assess ocular trauma or globe rupture? So the first thing with anything in ophthalmology is to take a good history as to how the trauma occurred because that can identify whether there's actually intraocular foreign body associated with the trauma that we can miss. So the things I usually like to know is when the trauma occurred and what exactly did happen with the trauma. Was it something that exploded? Was the patient hit in the face with a hammer? What was the mechanism of injury? And in addition to that, the other things I want to know in the history is what are the patient's medical conditions? Are they on any blood thinners? Um, because that may result in a retrobulbar hemorrhage associated with a globe rupture. And just their general health in, uh, in you know, quite fine detail. And then we go on to the uh, examination of the patient, the most important being visual acuity and then um, examination of ocular motility, uh, the eyelids and surrounding periocular structures, and then the intraocular examination. Now the intraocular examinations may not always be possible in someone that has globe rupture or severe ocular trauma because they may have a very swollen eyelid, you cannot open their eyelids uh, on the bedside, and they may actually have a laceration of the cornea, so you have to be very gentle when you examine them. So what's the immediate treatment? The first thing is to make sure that the patient is medically stable, that you're not just dealing with an eye problem, you're not missing something else like a bad head injury, whether they've got a subdural hemorrhage, an intracranial hemorrhage, if they have significant chest injury, uh, with thoracic trauma, if they've been involved in a motor vehicle accident. When I see a patient that has an open globe, you always want to make sure that you identify their tetanus status to work to make sure that they've had their tetanus immunization up to date. And also, if they've had any penetrating injury to the eye, you, as I said earlier, you want to be very careful in the manner that you examine these patients because you don't want to be too forceful and you, you don't want to pry the eyelids open. So in these patients that I think may have a penetrating injury or they may have a collapsed eye, I often get a CT scan of the globe or the orbits before even attempting to examine them. And typically if the CT scan shows that the globe is intact, there's no perforation, I may very gently open the eyelids with my fingers or in some cases use a spring speculum as well to keep the eyelids open after giving anesthesia. And then of course, if they do have a perforation, administering systemic antibiotics. In Australia, we most commonly use ciprofloxacin or quinolone-based antibiotics as a systemic prophylactic measure. <clears throat> so what if someone has a penetrating eye injury? So again, the same principles apply. If there's a high velocity missile that's gone into the eye, you want to make sure that that missile hasn't gone through the globe and it's lodged in the brain. And in the last month we had two cases like that in Australia where I trained. Um, if someone has a penetrating eye injury, again, the most important thing here is to get a CT scan of the orbits to exclude an intraocular foreign body. And CT scans are very safe and very easy to get hold of, so there's really very little reason that you wouldn't get a CT scan done. And then the sequence of repair of these patients. So typically it's done under general anesthesia where you may have an oculoplastic surgeon working with an ophthalmologist, uh, an intraocular surgeon anyway, to repair the eyelids as well as the globe. And I think uh, our previous speakers very nicely covered the principles of managing a corneal laceration where you remove any uh, denuded tissue that's uh, prolapsed, any dead iris tissue and then repositing healthy tissue back into the eye and then closing the corneal laceration. And that was shown very nicely. So 
I'll just quickly cover, you know, if you have a penetrating injury, this patient has a full thickness corneal laceration. So the principles of management here is to keep them fasted, make sure that their tetanus status is up to date, give them prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, systemically, I wouldn't administer any topical eye drops for this patient. I would ask the patient to wear a hard shield so they don't accidentally poke their eye and prolapse more tissue. And then the repair is done in the operating theatre. <coughs> this is a different patient that had an extensive corneal laceration with prolapse of a lot of intraocular tissue. And the primary repair involves doing an anterior vitrectomy and closing the cornea repositing as much iris tissue back into the globe and then dealing with any issues such as vitreous hemorrhage as a secondary procedure. So <clears throat> often you'll get an understanding as to whether someone has a penetrating injury based on the history. So if there was an explosion of some sort, if you know a stick was thrown into a patient's eye, you would be very suspicious in those instances of a penetrating injury. But you have to kind of go beyond that and you have to try and determine if someone has a rupture globe in addition to a penetrating injury, because often the two conditions can coexist. So what are the signs that someone may have a rupture globe or an open globe in addition to a penetrating injury? So a visual acuity that's poor may suggest that there's something more going on other than just a corneal laceration. So they may also have a vitreous hemorrhage a croidal hemorrhage, a croidal dis detachment, a dislocated intraocular lens, a macular hemorrhage, and so forth. If someone has a very thick conjunctiva with 360 de degrees of hemorrhage with a low intraocular pressure, you should be very suspicious that that patient has a globe rupture. The pressure does not have to be zero. Often the pressure in these patients are between three and eight millimeters of mercury, so they're not normal but they are low. If they have a peaked pupil, then you would be very suspicious that there's a full thickness laceration somewhere. And we spoke about croidal detachment and vitreous hemorrhage. So how do I approach a ruptured lobe? So when I say that the first exam may be the only opportunity, that's because a lot of things that determine long-term visual outcomes in the context of trauma is based on the first exam. So there's very good evidence, for instance, that if someone has poor vision at presentation after globe rupture or a penetrating injury, that they're also going to have poor vision in the long term. So as I've mentioned earlier, the process in which I examine these patients is first do a visual acuity if you can. As I said, sometimes you can't open the eyelids in order to do that. Check for an afferent pupil defect. Again, sometimes that's not always possible if there's a corneal laceration and iris incarcerated into the wound. And then try and illustrate as best as you can the details of the injury. So how big is the corneal wound? Does the wound extend from the cornea into the sclera? And where into the sclera does it extend? In terms of the management goals, we spoke about the immediate management. So tetanus, systemic antibiotics, keep the patient fasted, protect the eye with a hard shield. In terms of the actual surgical repair of the globe, sometimes you won't be able to formulate a surgical plan until you're actually in the operating theater. So the patient has a general anesthesia. I'd never do these repairs under local anesthesia. If the cornea is intact, that's usually a good sign. I do a 360 degree conjunctival pyridomy and take the conjunctiva back as far as I can. And then I try and identify where the wound is. Now sometimes with globe ruptures, the perforation is behind the insertion of the rectus muscle. And this is a really good point that I tell my residents that if you do a 360 degree pyridomy and you don't find a rupture, then you shouldn't stop your ex exploration there. What you need to do next is you need to take the muscles, the rectus muscles off the globe and explore beneath the muscles. Because very often the perforation or the site of rupture is just posterior to the site of insertion. Once you've identified where the rupture is, you need to close it. And it, it depends you know, which surgeon you speak to. We all have different techniques for closing the wound. 
but I typically like to use non-dissolvable sutures to close globe ruptures. So I either use proline, nylon, nino nylon sutures to close the wound. Some of my colleagues like to use 7 ovicral or 6 ovicral sutures to close it. Personally, I find that when you use non-dissolvable sutures, um, you have better apposition of the wound. So when you have to do a vitrectomy, which is very common in these patients for a vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment as a secondary procedure, you have much better control of the intraocular pressure when you've closed the eye with non-dissolvable sutures. I just find that with vicral sutures, often you'll get a lot more leaking during the operation, and that's simply my personal experience. <clears throat> okay, so we spoke about this, uh, so I'll move on. So in terms of prepping the eye for surgery, when I teach the residents how to prepare the eye, um, I still prep the eye with antiseptic. So in Australia, we, we use povidone iodine antiseptic to clean the eye. If I know that the patient has a globe rupture or a penetrating injury, I don't put the antiseptic on the globe because I'm worried that it's going to get inside the eye and it's going to cause intraocular inflammation. So what I do is I just prep the eyelids and in terms of holding the eyelids open, if there's a lot of orbital pressure and there's a lot of bleeding, I actually just use stay sutures on the eyelids to, use, to hold the eyelids open. I don't use a speculum because I find that with speculums you do get pressure on the globe which can actually prolapse more tissue if there's a large open wound. If the wound is small, then I would use a spring speculum and very rarely I'd use a Lieberman speculum where you can adjust the tension. But you have to be very careful in these patients that have an open rupture that if you start using a speculum with a lot of pressure, you will get a lot of posterior pressure, which will make the surgery very difficult. And it'll encourage intraocular contents to come out of the wound, such as the retina and the vitreous. In terms of when should you repair these operations, the short answer, to, uh, when should you repair these injuries? The short answer is as soon as possible. So there's very good evidence now in the studies and there was a recent article in the British Journal of Ophthalmology that compared the outcomes in patients uh, that had globe rupture and penetrating injuries and they looked at the timing of the surgery. Now typically if the surgery, sorry, if the surgery is done within 24 hours, um, that's fine. But you don't want to leave these cases for five or seven days before they're repaired because then the risk of PVR detachments, endophthalmitis, um, vitreous hemorrhage is much higher and croidal hemorrhage as well. So I normally try and get this done as soon as possible but if a patient comes into the emergency department at one in the morning with a corneal laceration I don't think they need to be done at 1.30 that morning. We normally do them at 8 o'clock the next morning on the elective surgical list and that's completely fine. You don't have to rush in and do this in the middle of the night. Often you'll get an inexperienced anaesthetist, inexperienced nursing staff to do the surgery, which can make it a little bit more complicated. So I try and do this in a controlled environment as much as possible. And I, as I said, I always do this under general anaesthetic because sometimes you may assume that the eye is not ruptured and that the eye uh, doesn't have a laceration. And I have known some of my colleagues to do this under subtenon, so peribulbar anesthesia. And then when you do the exploration, you find that there's an open eye and it can, be, it can become very messy when you try and repair it under local anesthetic. And sometimes the surgery can take 20 minutes, sometimes it can take three hours. You never know what you're going to find until you do that pyridomy. So it's always best to give the patient um, a general anesthetic if possible. Um, so what are the principles of wound repair? So as I said, prepping the eye is very important. You know, keep it sterile, but don't put antiseptic on the globe if you think it's open. Um, be very mindful about the speculum. You don't want to encourage posterior pressure. That's unnecessary. And the first thing you want to do is try and oppose as much tissue as possible. So if, the corneal lacer if there's an obvious corneal laceration, I would repair that first before doing the exploration to look for a scleral rupture or a globe rupture. Always aim for a watertight closure. You can always check with intraoperative fluorescein on the eye whether it's a side or positive or negative and always bury the knots. 
may sound like a simple thing to do to bury the notes, but if you forget to do that, it'll just irritate the patient's eyes and cause post-operative inflammation and a lot of discomfort. That's the immediate management of the surgery. Now, the post-operative management in terms of pain relief for these patients, having a bandaged contact lens for five or seven days can be really nice for the patient in terms of pain relief because often these patients have a very swollen conjunctiva, they have many sutures on the cornea and they find it very irritating. Having a cornea, a contact lens on the eye can only, it promotes healing of the surface of the eye in my opinion, but also gives a lot of pain relief. The sutures that we use to close corneal lacerations, often I would leave in the eye for at least four to eight weeks before even considering removing it. Um, in children, of course, you don't want to leave the sutures in there for too long because of the risk of amblyopia. You want to rehabilitate the vision as soon as possible. And then after you've done the primary repair, you're going to be observing the patient for complications of the posterior segment. So delayed retinal detachment and croidal detachments are the two main things that I would be worried about in patients that have an open injury such as a globe rupture or a penetrating eye injury. These patients, in terms of what medications I put them on after surgery, I would put them on topical steroid eye drops every two hours for the first one or two weeks. I would put them on topical antibiotics, whether it's a ciprofloxacin-based antibiotic or chloramphenicol, every two hours for the first week. Usually I tell the patient to wear a shield for the first week, just so they don't accidentally traumatise the eye. I always cycloplege them with atropine or homatropine or cycloplentilate. And I usually cover them for two weeks with systemic antibiotics, whether it's ciprofloxacin, um, is the most common antibiotic that we use. I don't typically give them um, systemic steroids unless it's a very bad rupture and there's a choroidal detachment as well. So I'm just going to move a little bit and talk about posterior scleral rupture, which is a very specific type of globe rupture. It's less common than the anterior ruptures, but it's something you don't want to miss. So a posterior scleral rupture can happen after, with a sharp injury, like a missile entering the eye, or it could be from a very bad blunt injury. So an elderly patient can fall and they can whack their face on a very blunt object and present with a blunt eye injury. And this is what a blunt, uh, a posterior scleral rupture typically looks like. Okay, it can be very easily missed. So you have to examine these patients very carefully. So what are the things that you look for for a posterior rupture? So for instance, if someone has a penetrating injury of the cornea, it's very obvious. If they have a scleral rupture that's anterior with a peaked pupil, that's also very obvious. But this patient, you may just suspect that they have a high femur from a blunt eye injury and discharge them without um, you know, checking carefully for a posterior rupture. So there are th three things I tell my residents that would indicate a patient has a posterior rupture. If they have a very deep anterior chamber, and sometimes in patients with high myopia, they will have a very deep anterior chamber. But the way you can check whether they have a pathological deep anterior chamber or a physiological one is to compare the two eyes. So if you look at this patient, their anterior chamber depth may be five millimeters. If you looked at their fellow eye, it may be 2.2 millimeters. And you, that would, should give you a very strong indication that there may be a posterior rupture in this patient. The other thing is low intraocular pressure. So really important to remember that the pressure does not have to be zero, okay? If the pressure in the left eye is 20 millimeters of mercury and the pressure in the eye of a trauma is five, you have to think, does this patient have trauma uh, with a posterior rupture? And again, if someone has a lot of conjunctival swelling and hemorrhage, and you can't actually see the sclera because there's too much blood, you should have a very low threshold to explore these patients for a rupture. Okay, the clinical examination sometimes will be very misleading. There was a study that looked at classifying scleral ruptures according to the zone in the eye, you know, superior, inferior, um, nasal, temporal, 
and then they talked about anterior and posterior ruptures and I think it's very nice to have this for a research study but in terms of the practicalities of clinical ophthalmology it's probably not too much relevant with the exception of the fact that posterior scleral ruptures can typically do worse than anterior scleral ruptures because can they, they can often be misdiagnosed and they can be missed and they have a higher risk of developing a retinal detachment. So the vitreoretinal complications of a posterior scleral rupture are more common than if you have a corneal laceration with some scleral defect. And the things as a vitreoretinal surgeon that we often have to deal with are things like retinal detachment. And remember, the retinal detachment doesn't have to happen at the time of the injury. Often it's a delayed process. So they have a globe rupture that's repaired and then two or four weeks later they develop a retinal detachment and often these are aggressive detachments with PVR. The other complications are vitreous hemorrhage, choroidal hemorrhage, choroidal detachment, long-term optic atrophy and also macular hemorrhage and macular scarring. So I just want to share with you a case that uh, this is a patient of mine, so it's a young patient, it's a 23-year-old male who had a right posterior scleral rupture after a very bad blunt eye injury, okay? So he presented through the emergency department with a visual acuity of light perception. And after presentation, he had uh, the surgery performed by a general ophthalmologist where the posterior rupture was identified uh, with a 360 degree pyridomy and it was closed very nicely. So the surgery was done very well. And then the patient was referred to me looking like that. So this is an image of the retina. So um, from this you can see that um, you know he, uh, there are a few things going on. Okay so first of all if you looked at the superior retina you can see where the rupture is. You can see that there's a hemorrhage and you can actually see the retina tissue incarcerated into that site. If you looked at the retina, on the superior retina, there's also a submacular hemorrhage. And look at that, if you looked at the vitreous, because there's blood in the vitreous, the vitreous is actually being stained. And you can see that the vitreous have, has the straight lines, which is radiating into the point of the rupture. So you can be 100% sure that this patient has vitreous incarceration, as well as retinal incarceration at the site of the posterior rupture. And this is the B-scan ultrasound and it again shows it very nicely that there's vitreous and retinal incarceration at the site of the rupture. And if you looked at the OCT, you can see because it's quite a posterior rupture, you can actually see the point of rupture on the OCT. You can see that the RPE band is discontinuous and the choroid, there's a big defect there as well. So how did I manage this patient? Well, first of all, I didn't want to rush in and do surgery on this patient. And there's two reasons for that. The first is because I'd wanted the wounds, the scleral wounds to heal as best as possible before doing any vitrectomy surgery. Because often in these patients, even though the primary repair is done very nicely, when you have the infusion running into the vitreous, you will often find a leak and the eye can be hypotenuse during the operation and when that happens you're at increased risk of choroidal hemorrhage and choroidal detachment and pushing the retinal tissue further into the scleral laceration. So I try and wait at least two weeks in these patients before doing any vitrectomy surgery if I can help it. Okay? The second reason I want to delay surgery in this patient is because I want the patient to develop a vitreous detachment naturally as best as possible. Because remember, when we do vitrectomy surgery, one of the most important principles of doing any vitrectomy surgery is to detach the vitreous from the retina. That principle is applied to any operation, whether it's a macular hole, whether you're doing retinal detachment, whether you're operating on a diabetic patient. You want to separate the vitreous from the retina as best as possible because that reduces the risk of reproliferation of tissue. And it's best if the patient can do that naturally. So if someone has an intraocular foreign body or a vitreous hemorrhage, that will often stimulate the vitreous to detach within a few weeks. So I want to delay that surgery if I can and wait for that to happen.
Having said that, I want to watch the patient very care closely, okay? So usually with these patients, I see them every week. So if I'm not going to operate, I will be observing them, okay? Now this is the same patient two weeks later. And you can see that the vitreous hemorrhage is starting to clear, which is nice. But when you do the B-scan, the patient's now developing a peripheral retinal detachment, okay? So now I have to do something, my hand is forced. And that's simply because the vitreous is pulling and pulling on the retina that it's induced a peripheral retinal break in the inferior retina. So now I have to do vitrectomy. So what I did was I did a vitrectomy and then I did what's, what's called a low-class retinectomy. So I went into the eye and removed all the tissue that was incarcerated into the sclera. I applied laser and I put silicon oil into the eye. So in all trauma cases with retinal detachment, I always put silicon oil into the eye. It's because if you put gas into the eye, the risk of retinal redetachment is very high. And the studies have shown that. And this is what the eye looks like uh, one week after surgery. Okay, I just want to point out a few things to you. If you look, that's blood, that's old blood. Um, under the retina. So the haemoglobin from the blood is starting to go away and is starting to get this pale colour. And that's where there was one retinal tear that I identified during surgery and that's the site of retinal incarceration. So you can see that I've removed all the tissue that was incarcerated into the scleral wound and we've sealed that nicely with laser. Okay. So I usually leave the oil into the eye for six months and I'd remove the oil. And this patient, after removing the oil, their vision has gone to 636. You can see a lot of the submacular blood has resolved. It's been absorbed by the body and it's nicely scarred and the retina has nicely reattached. And that's what it looks like. And they're developing an early cataract. That's what this black stuff is that you're seeing on the retina. So, what are the predictors of long-term visual outcomes if you see someone with scleral rupture? As I told you earlier on in the talk, um, the most important predictors are actually what you identify at the baseline examination. So if they have a visual acuity of light perception, they will probably have worse vision in the long term than someone that presents with a visual acuity of 6 on 24. So that's why it's very important to document that visual acuity when they present. People that have bigger ruptures will do worse than people that have smaller ruptures, simply because the risk of retinal detachment and PVR is much higher in those patients. If they have high femur, vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment, or macular hemorrhage at the first visit, at the time of presentation, those patients often will also have worse visual outcomes. So I think that's the end of the talk. So thank you all very much for your time and attention.